My name is Adrian Reich, and I've been coming to Hope since 2012 when my husband and I moved here from New Mexico. I started subbing in Kin City because I saw a huge need and I was already doing middle school volunteering with the check-in because I had told God I only have 30 minutes a week for every other week to do things. But every time I would sit in a service and they would say, we need more adult leaders for Kid City, I wouldn't feel this peace of saying, I'm doing what God's asked me to do. And I still felt this unrest. So then I would volunteer a little bit more and I decided to say, okay, I will now be a consistent volunteer in a third grade classroom every other week. Well, we always wanna have smaller Kid City, small groups with the kids. And you were hoping for like five to eight kids is what I think we would want. But because of the amount of volunteers we have, normally our group sizes are 10 to 12 to 15. And I don't know about you, but it's really hard to keep 15 kids engaged with one leader. And I would see that constantly when I was going into the classrooms and I thought, well, I'm praying for someone to be a really great small group leader for my child and I have four of them. Uh, and I really felt like God was saying, you are praying and you are the answer to your prayer. Like You need to be the one that is consistently in these classrooms being another leader so that the group sizes could be smaller. So what I've seen by being able to be in a classroom and have those smaller group settings, or just to have the consistency of the same people there every week, is that we get to know these kids' names. So I know if I see like John and Sarah, and if I put them in a small group together, I know that no one is going to be paying attention. So I know to put them in different groups where they can make other friends and then just be more intimate with their leaders and paying attention to their leaders. And then if I see someone like Jane sitting in the back and worshiping and praising Jesus, I know that I should talk to her mom afterward to tell her, Jane, she's going to be a really great worship leader one day. Why don't you have her come in for our Kid City worship team? By saying yes to serving and doing it consistently, we've created a beautiful family rhythm. We have a chalkboard wall and we write out what we're doing every day or every week and we'll say mama and papa serve but we also put all serve because our kids are serving as well by knowing they're giving up time with being at home and playing with their toys and they're going to go to intersection or a second service so they all see that this is a family effort and I'm really really hopeful that as they see us serving that we're just doing a good example for them later on of what it looks like to serve Jesus in small and big ways as they get older into adolescence and adulthood. So a lot of times I go into serving aspects because I'm trying to figure out how I can give back and how I can do things, how I can have an impact on people's lives. God then calls me by my own name and says, Adrian, I see you as this and this and this that I didn't even know about myself as I've been serving. I would never have thought I was good at certain tasks, but because I've been put into these different roles, God has shown me so many better things about myself than I even knew I had. You know, I am personally so grateful for Adrienne and her husband, Pete. They serve on a regular basis at our Apex campus, and they're just an example of so many amazing people in this church at Hope that serve us on a regular basis, and that's a beautiful picture of exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Well, I have a question for you. Have you ever lost your way? Like, not figuratively, because we can all say yes to that, right? but literally lost your way or realized you didn't know the way to the extent where like panic and fear begins to overwhelm you. That happened to me in a way that I will never forget. A few years ago, Dawn and I had the opportunity to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary by going to France and skiing in the Alps for a few days. It was amazing. I grew up in Canada, so I love winter sports. The difference is nowadays I would much rather go and visit winter than have winter come and visit me. But it was awesome. But the first day at the mountain, not so great. I mean, it was snowing, cloudy, foggy, the poor visibility, and the conditions were getting worse as the day went on. So by early afternoon, Dawn said, I'm done for the day. Smart woman, but not me. I said, no, I'm going to stay out and ski a little longer. I mean, we're only here for a few days. i got to get my money's worth, right? And I thought, I've skied big mountains before. I know that when the bottom of a mountain gets socked in, often the clouds have moved so low that at the upper elevations, it's clear and sunny. And so with an overconfidence in my own abilities and way too much optimism, I decided to go higher and higher. I took a series of chairlifts all the way to the top of the mountain with each new chairlift, chairlift believing that I was going to break through the clouds. The problem is, that didn't happen. I get off that final chairlift, and I can barely see my skis, never mind 10 feet in front of me. 
And so very cautiously, I skied down the first few hundred yards, and then I get to a flat section. And I stop momentarily. I'm, I'm looking around, trying to find the trail where it's leading. And then I got disoriented. I couldn't, I couldn't tell up from down, right from left, and I got scared. I mean, have you ever been there where you have to, like, talk yourself off the ledge? So it's like, come on, Doug, mind over matter. Don't freak out. You can do this. You're a good enough skier. But wait, there's no other skiers up here right now. And I don't know this mountain. And oh, yeah, I've skied above the tree line enough to know that there are often huge cliffs and drop-offs within feet of the trail. And at this point, I am freaking out, terrified. I'm calling out to God, God, I don't know what I have done, but get me off this mountain. And I stood there for what felt like hours, and then I heard some sounds on the snow, skis coming my way. And with a good amount of awkward desperation, I call out, hello, help me. And in just a few seconds, two skiers stopped right beside me. Two guys from Switzerland, and they spoke English. Good thing for me. They said, are you hurt? I said, no, but I'm an idiot. <laughs> I should not be up here right now. I don't know this mountain. And yeah, with these conditions, guys, I'm freaking out. Can you help me? And they said, good enough. We know this mountain very well, but none of us should be up here right now. They said, we can lead you down to safety, and we'll go slow, but you have to stay close and do not take your eyes off us. You better believe I didn't. I followed them as closely as I could all the way down the mountain to safety. You know, interestingly, the, the next day was perfectly sunny and clear, and so I went back up to the same place on the mountain so I could ski that same trail on a clear day and see what I was missing the day before. And I gotta tell you, it made me sick to my stomach to see the cliffs and the drop-offs, the dangers that were literally feet away from where I was the day before. See, if I hadn't have closely followed my best new friends from Switzerland, I'm not sure what would have happened. And I'm glad that I'm still around to talk about it, but what a life lesson. I mean, and that's just a small picture of a much bigger problem in my life. Far too often I have realized when I have leaned into my own instincts, my own abilities and experience, I often get lost, lose my way. You know, King Solomon said in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. I almost experienced that real time. And what a warning from King Solomon. That's not good news. A couple of weeks ago, we finished a series that we called The Foundations of the Faith, and in that series, we did talk about some really good news. The good news that we are all created by a loving God in his image for relationship with him and purpose, but sin has broken that relationship. We are broken, but we can be fixed, and we're on our way to something better. And the way that we're fixed is through Jesus. Jesus himself says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, today we're starting a brand new series of messages that we are calling The Jesus Way, Practices of a Vibrant Faith. And in this series, we want to really key in on how Jesus lived his life, look at some of his practices, and see how if we incorporate those into our life, how that can change us, how that can bring us to a more vibrant faith, and ultimately, a more abundant life. And today we want to begin by looking at one of those most common practices of Jesus, and that's serving others. See, you can't talk about the Jesus way and not talk about serving. It's not only what he did, it is who he was. You know, there's an interesting story in the New Testament of these two brothers, James and John, they're disciples of Jesus, and as they're following him around, like the other disciples, they believed that one day he was going to overthrow the Roman government and set up his own kingdom. He was going to be physical king. And so they said to him one day, hey, when you become king, will you allow one of us to sit on your left and one to sit on your right, which were places of position, authority, power? And look at the end of this interaction in Mark chapter 10, 42. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. 
Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. See, in this passage, Jesus is laying down a new framework of greatness by serving. It's as, it's as, as if he's saying, guys, now that you're following me, you are living in an upside down kingdom. We don't do things the way the world does it. We don't go after power, after position. If you want to be great in my kingdom, you serve. You serve to become great. Because even I, the son of man, did not come to be served, but to serve. And if you stop and think about that, Jesus, our Messiah, did not come to be served, but to serve. So if we choose to follow the Jesus way, we choose to serve and live a life of servanthood. And see, the bottom line is we are never more like Jesus than when we are serving others. But how? What does that look like to serve others? Well, to answer that question, I want us to unpack a key passage from the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians, chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. If not, you can follow along on the screen. But we're going to read from verse 3 to 11. And I'm going to read the whole passage, and then we'll go back and break it down. Paul says, starting in verse 3, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord, amen. Well, to give you a little context here, Paul is writing this letter while he is under house arrest in the city of Rome. He is writing to Christ followers back in Philippi who are a part of a church that he, Paul, planted years earlier, and he loves these people. You can see great affection throughout this short letter, but in this letter, Paul is encouraging these Christ followers to continue to grow as they follow Christ in the way that they serve God, and they serve one another. And so in this passage we just read, Paul is lifting Jesus up as the supreme example of what this life of servanthood looks like. He's teaching us that to serve like Jesus, our heart and mind needs to change. That's why he says in verse three, do nothing from selfish ambition. He wouldn't have wrote that if he didn't think that we needed to hear that. That's our nature. Selfish ambition. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest. That's interesting there because he says not only. See, Paul knows there are times in life we have to look at our own interests. We have to take care of ourselves, take care of our family. But he says don't look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So let me ask you, how's that going for you? Like seriously. You know, I know that there's some people among us that you are so naturally gifted for serving, you love to serve behind the scenes, you need no credit at all, and you are a gift to us, but that's not me. That's not most of us. I think for most of us, it's far easier to be served than to serve. You know, it's a part of our broken nature to be served. And it's a part of our nature that needs to change as we follow the Jesus way. See, our hearts and our interests need to become more others-focused. But it's not just our hearts that need to change. Paul says it's our mind that needs to change. Like, take on the mind of Christ, verse 5. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. See, Jesus didn't grasp on to his rights and privileges. He didn't cling to equality with God, but instead, he emptied himself 
of those things and took on the form of a servant. And that phrase is so important, taking on the form of a servant, because it speaks of a choice. See, Jesus didn't passively allow this to happen to him or against his will. No, he chose to set certain things aside in order to take on other things, the form, the human form and the form of a servant. He chose this. And what did this form of a servant look like when Jesus was here on earth, when he walked this earth? Well, I want us to leave Philippians and Paul just for a few minutes. We'll come back. And I want us to take a look at a few examples from the life of Jesus. Like his first miracle, turning water into wine. Some of us get so excited about this water to wine part that we miss the act of servanthood here. Because in their culture, it was embarrassing, actually shameful, if the host family of a wedding celebration ran out of wine. So Jesus, knowing that, he decides to do this miracle. Yes, because he was God, and he had the supernatural power to turn this dirty water into a fine cabernet. But don't miss the fact that he did this to serve a family, to help them save face, to allow this young couple and their family to throw the celebration and the party that they had always dreamed of. It was an act of service. Or how about when Jesus healed the woman with the issue of blood in Matthew 9 or Mark 5? He's actually on his way to do another healing. He's going to Jairus' house to heal his daughter, and that's a pretty important agenda. And yet, on his way, he allows himself to be interrupted and touched by this woman. This woman who had, for far too long, had suffered with a physical illness, but not only that, she was carrying the shame and disgrace that accompanied her sickness. And Jesus so beautifully slows down his agenda. And he not only allows her to touch him, and by doing that, being physically healed, but he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. And when Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, calls her daughter, he restores her dignity and not only heals her physically, but also emotionally. Again, a beautiful act of compassion. Or one of my favorite stories is found in Luke 7 where Jesus raises the son of a woman in the town of Nain. It says that Jesus and his disciples come up on this funeral procession and Jesus realizes that the young man who has just died is the son, the only son, of a woman who has already lost her husband. And see, Jesus is so in tune with his culture that he knows that this woman has just lost all hope of being provided for, cared for, into her old age. And so in this act of supernatural power, but beautiful compassion, Jesus raises this young man back to life and gives him as a gift back to his mother. I want to challenge all of us this week to take time to go through the different miracles of Jesus. If you don't know where to find them, Google it. Google will tell you where they're found in the four different gospels. And just take time to go through those miracles and look not only for the supernatural power in that miracle, but also the form of a servant. Also those acts of compassion, restoring dignity. And one more example, this wasn't one of his miracles, but a time when Jesus took on the form of a servant, like literally a house servant. Very famous story recorded in John 13. It's the night before Jesus goes to the cross. He's with his disciples, about to have dinner, and he sees an opportunity, or maybe more accurately, smells an opportunity to serve these guys by washing their feet. Like, can we agree, feet are kind of gross, but especially these guys' feet. They didn't wear enclosed shoes. They didn't have Jordans. They were walking around maybe in sandals, but probably in bare feet through the streets of Jerusalem. I mean, they're walking through dust and dirt and mud and stepping in God knows what. And Jesus, in an act of servanthood, gets down on his hands and knees and washes their feet. And after this incredible act of servanthood, he challenges them. He says, guys, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have done this for you, you should serve each other in similar ways, acts of service. He says, I have set an example for you. See, these are the very types and acts that Paul is pointing back to in Philippians 2 when he says that Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. See, Jesus gave up a whole lot to take on that form of a servant, but the same is true for us. Serving like Jesus will cost us something. 
If we're going to serve others the Jesus way, we need to be willing to let go of some things, let go of some privileges, and what things? What does that look like for us? Well, I wanna suggest a few things that serving others will cost us. How about time? It takes time to serve others, right? And if we're not careful, we will allow our society to just throw us into so much busyness that we barely have the margin to care for ourselves or our family, never mind serve other people. Because serving others takes time. Or how about opportunities? And I know we live in a land of opportunities, and that is great in so many ways. But can we just agree that sometimes the amount of opportunities becomes overwhelming? I remember 12 years ago when we moved here from living in Uganda, East Africa for a few years, and I would get decision paralysis just standing in an aisle of a grocery store. Like, is it necessary to have 85 different types of mayonnaise? (laughs) Or trying to figure out what one sport or lesson or activity our kids were going to be a part of. Like, there is serious societal pressure in this country for your children to be involved in every opportunity that is open to them. And if you don't involve them in that, then you're a terrible parent. We can allow ourselves to believe that, but is that even healthy for you or for them? You know, I was talking to one of our volunteers a couple weeks ago, a dad, and he was telling me, hey, our son just made a travel team in soccer, and I'm about to say congratulations, and he says, but we haven't decided yet if we're going to allow him to play, because we have placed a very high value on church and on serving others. What an incredible example of what it looks like to set aside a good opportunity for a better opportunity serving others. See, here's my fear in our current society. As we continue to grow in the amount of opportunities, in the amount of wealth and affluence that we have, my fear is that more and more people are going to opt out of Jesus and opt out of his church. Convenience is another thing we need to be willing to give up in order to serve, and hey, we love convenience. I mean, we have worked very hard in our society to make sure that all of us are inconvenienced as little as possible. I don't know about you, but for me, I'm usually pretty willing to serve to the point of convenience. In other words, like if it fits in my schedule, or if it doesn't push me too far out of my comfort zone, I'm all in. Let's go. But as soon as it becomes inconvenient, man, that takes a whole nother level of commitment for me. And that might be true of you as well. See, here's the reality. If we are going to serve as Jesus did, it will be inconvenient. Let me give you an example. Presidium training. Now, we have some volunteers here who know exactly what I'm talking about. We live in a crazy world right now. And so we as a church have asked all of our staff and many of our volunteers to go through some online training so that we can continue to uphold the value of safety in our ministry environments. And when we asked you as volunteers to do that, we understand that is inconvenient. But here's the beautiful thing. Hundreds of volunteers across Hope have done that training. And we are so grateful that you would be inconvenienced to do that. Here's another thing we need to be willing to give up in order to serve others, individualism. There's some other I words that would work here, independence, isolation, I, I, I. I mean, we live in an I culture, right? Uh, We are being told by social media and marketers that we are, I am, the most important person there is. We are constantly being pulled into hyper-individualism. You know, here in our Western cultures of America, Canada, Western Europe, Man, we love individualism. We love individual freedom, autonomy, personal achievement. But in some other cultures in our world, like Asia, Africa, even the Middle East, where Jesus was born and did his ministry, they have much more of a group mentality, groupthink. We over me. It takes a village mentality. And this leads to more interconnectedness, more interdependence, Listen, every, every culture has its pros and cons. I'm not bashing on our culture, but what I am saying is if you choose to serve the way Jesus did, it's going against the flow. It's countercultural. We can't isolate ourselves from others. You know, the only time that Jesus moved away 
into privacy was when he got away to be with his father in prayer, to be filled back up, refueled in order to go once again and serve others. We're gonna hear more about that in this series. But when it comes to serving others, there has to be an others. So let me ask you, who are the others in your life? What are we willing to give up in order to serve others? So going back to Philippians 2, Paul goes on in verse eight and he says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, here's the truth that Paul is driving home. Serving like Jesus requires humility and obedience. Jesus, this one who emptied himself to take on the form of a servant, he became humble and obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, execution of the worst kind. And that's why Paul ends this passage with these beautiful words. Therefore, because of this, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, he went to the extreme of servanthood. The greatest act of service the world has ever seen will ever see. And because he did that, He gets the name above every name. He gets exalted higher than everyone. But here's the good news for you and I. We will never be asked to go to the level of obedience of giving up our life for the sake of the sin of the whole world. I mean, it wouldn't work. It took a perfect sacrifice, and that's not you. That's not me. And most of us will never have to give up our physical life for the sake of the kingdom of God. There are people around this world that do that daily, but in our country of freedom, most of us won't have to go to that level of obedience. But here's the challenge for every single one of us. Are we willing to change our minds, to give up some things, to humble ourselves, and in obedience serve others the way that Jesus did? That's how we serve, taking on the form of a servant. But where do we serve? We serve in community. And I want to suggest to you, community has two aspects. Our faith community, right here at Hope Community Church. If you consider this your church, you are a part of a faith community. Paul says, you are a part of the body of Christ. He talks in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, about the the church being the body. And he says that God has placed gifts in the body. Not just corporate gifts, but individual gifts in each one of us. And if you are not serving as a part of this body, we are missing a really key piece to the puzzle. You are a beautiful thread in a mosaic that God is trying to put together through Hope Community Church. We serve in our faith community. That's why Paul says in Galatians 6.10, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. That's serving. But look what he says and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So let me give you some examples of what that looks like here at Hope. We've just celebrated our 30th anniversary, and we have some people here that serve weekly that served at the very first service ever at Hope Community Church, faithfully serving for 30 years, and we are grateful for you. We have people who have only been here a few months and have already jumped into serving, and we are grateful for you. We have some incredible first responders at this church who use the best days and hours of their life to serve our communities, keeping us safe and being first responders, and yet they come on the weekends and choose to serve. You know, one of those is one of the captains for the Cary Fire Department, and every Sunday at Apex, he is on the floor with five-year-old boys serving as a small group leader in Kid City, and he loves it. He loves it, and He is pouring into these boys. We have police in Apex and in Cary that serve faithfully and they come on the weekends to serve as a part of first impressions out in the parking lot as roadies or in the coffee shop or next steps or as ushers and greeters or serving in Kid City, serving as a part of our safety team. They serve faithfully. You know, we have teachers in Wake County Public Schools that all week long they're investing into children and students and yet they come on the weekends to serve us in Kid City, First Impressions, Special Needs Ministry. Two of those young elementary teachers I know, this summer they are leading one of our mission teams, our Global Hope teams down in Nicaragua, as an act of service, and we are grateful for you. 
You know, we have people here that I know at Hope Community Church that every single day they struggle with physical ailments, even emotional ailments that would give them plenty of excuses not to serve, and yet they prioritize serving so much that each week they come through the pain, pushing through the pain, they come and they serve as a part of our food ministry or a homework club or midweek volunteers. These are the kinds of people that make Hope Community Church such a great church. But that's probably only about 20% currently of our church. There's a lot of missing pieces to this beautiful puzzle. And we need you to serve. But we don't only serve in the church. We serve in our community at large. And we live on mission. That's why you hear us talk here at Hope so much about living on mission where we live, learn, work, and play so that we can serve our communities, our world. Because here's the thing. When we serve our communities in this way, we reflect the Jesus way to a world that is watching and desperately looking for hope. And when we serve in the Jesus way, we grow. Our hearts are transformed as we serve. So what's your next step today? If you're not serving, serve. I wanna challenge you. Serve, find a place to serve right here in this community of faith. The easiest way to do that is text the word serve to 72989 and we'll send you back a link to our serve page and you can go through different opportunities there. Find one that you would like to try, sign up for that. We'll get back to you and get you through those first looks and all that's involved there. But even better, if you're here physically, then stop by our next steps area after the service and talk to a real live human being and just say, hey, I wanna serve and they will help you get connected. But if you're already serving, Man, once again, thank you for serving. You get it. You get that you grow as you serve. You become more like Jesus. You know the joy that there is in serving. But I have a next step for you as well. This week, before you serve next time, will you think of one person here at Hope, maybe they're a part of your small group, a family or friend, who you know is not serving regularly. And would you invite them into serving with you? Listen, I know that different seasons of life bring different responsibilities, different time commitments. And maybe it's true that for Dawn and I, now that we're empty nesters, maybe it's easier for us to serve in our church and in our community. But here's what I know. Regardless of stage, regardless of responsibilities, Jesus is calling all of us to become more like him as we serve others. Remember, we are never more like Jesus than when we are serving others because serving is the Jesus way. Will you pray with me? Father God, I wanna thank you for reminding us of the power of your word. Remind us that you have created us in your image and that imago day, the image of God is truly unlocked and grown within us as we begin to serve and take on the form of a servant. And Jesus, you're the most beautiful example that there ever will be of that. I pray that today we are inspired to serve others the way you served us. God, open our eyes to the interests of others. Let us this week place others' interest above our own and in your way, the Jesus way, serve others. We thank you for all these things and we pray it all in your name, Jesus. Amen.